because uh, it was really popular and seems to be a topic that people often find uh, challenging or they'd like to know more about. So uh, today we're talking about how can we demonstrate the strategic value of HR and in particular we'll drill down into how we can use an HR balance scorecard to help us do that. Um, in terms of introducing you and again um, if you've been on a a webinar with me before then you might know the drill. Uh, it would be great if you uh, try to interact as much as possible. I can't turn microphones on or cameras because there's too many people on the call to be able to do that but what would be brilliant is if you want to say hi in the chat, um, tell us where you are in the country, perhaps what your role is, uh, just to find that chat if you're not familiar with it. So uh, you should be able to find your toolbar and usually there's either chat there as a specific area or you can go more and you'll be able to chat on it. So do introduce yourselves in the chat because I will be getting you to um, input various things here and there. And uh, I'll just briefly introduce myself. I've got a corporate learning and development um, background in terms of this. This is something that I've, I've done for a number of years. Uh, I'm also a chartered psychologist and um, my my role that I do at the moment is very much about being the founder and CEO of Actors Performance Management Software. Now, this whole principle of a balanced scorecard is something that I had to put in place in my previous life. Um, and we ran the whole business using a business balanced scorecard and we cascaded it down. And this is something we do with our business. We'll talk about the pros and cons of that. Um, if you are interested in podcasts and you've not come across it I also host a podcast called the HR Uprising podcast we do have a podcast on this topic so uh, if you wanted to go back and listen to anything like this again then you can listen to a similar um, a similar story if you like on the podcast uh, the other thing letting you know I'll tell you more about this at the end we will be doing a special series on the podcast from next week so it's our 75th episode on Monday and we've got Bruce Daisley of Eat Sleep Work Repeat joining us on Monday and then from from Wednesday and every Wednesday hence um, for eight weeks there will be a management podcast aimed at line managers so if you guys I can see that we've got people some I've got line managers on here actually already and I've got L&D and um, training people so if you've got someone that you want to support your line managers let's say who are finding it challenging managing people remotely then you might find that that's something interesting to direct them to so we'll put links on on the show notes if you're somebody who likes a copy of the slides we will send them out to you automatically after this so my colleague Caitlin will send you an email with a follow-up and these links in it so you can um, access this and use it if it's helpful so thanks guys welcome Kaylee, Alessio, Liam, I can see the chats coming through, um, Hannah all the way from Philippines so uh, welcome everybody we've got people from Latvia and the Philippines wow um, I'll slow down gosh you're all over the world I'm really <laughs> impressed welcome everybody I've no idea tell us what time it is where you are um, but in the meantime I'll tell you what we're going to cover during this particular webinar so um, the, the agenda really is we're doing some introductions here. We're going to talk about how we build the strategy and how to then go into building an HR balance scorecard. That's the key focus. Now, why do we even think about um, building a, a scorecard? And the main reason here is, and I'm sure that everyone here is, is, is aware of this, is that very often we are accused as HR professionals that we're not aligned enough or not strategic enough it's a criticism that seems to be unfairly leveled I think at our um, profession more than others um, but you can see here from the stats that many HR officers say that the most important um, skill that they need to add value to their business according to Corn Ferry or oh, one of the 41% say this is that business acumen is a key skill lots of people don't know how to translate strategy into action and that's where this balanced scorecard can help you um, and many people feel that we don't have enough business KPIs as part of their evaluation. So those are various statistics that I gathered out there, which really the purpose of this is about helping people build confidence in terms of how they can be more strategic and demonstrate more strategic value. I think it's one of those words that sometimes we we almost feel feel. Um, we don't know what it is um, and while we do this poll I'm going to raise a poll for you um, I'll explain what, how I used to feel myself oh someone's found the drawings tool was well done I'll be getting to you to use those later um, so I've got a poll which is going to put up and I'm going to aim to launch it myself without Helen in the background's help she's here to support I've, I've just going to let you know guys I've got three screens for the first time so I'm hoping I can see the chat and and um, manage other things at the same time but I might be trying to over 
multitask, I don't know. So I'm just going to put a poll up and this is about getting you to think about your confidence levels. It's an, it is an anonymous poll. So whatever you say is fine. I don't know who's saying what, um, but there's two questions I'm going to post. One is how confident do you feel about being strategic? Do you feel that you actually are? Um, so if so, put five. Um, or if you really don't think you even quite know what being strategic is, put one. And then the second one is actually how successful or how confident do you feel about defining success metrics? And again, it's that one to five. So I'm launching the polling now um, and I'm hoping that you can see the polling so as you're viewing it. So I'm, I'm assuming they'll be told if you can't. Can see it. Um, Brilliant. Thanks, Helen. And, I, and one of the analogies while you're voting, I'll share with you. So when I was working in house and I reported into the HR director and I was head of learning and development, we had a competency um, assessment. And I remember going in and part of our leadership competencies, one of them was strategic thinking. And I remember my manager and he said, oh, well, you're not really strategic, are you? I said, well, actually, I think I probably am quite strategic. And I gave him some examples of where I'd um, developed strategies for the department and made connections with the business strategy. And it was only when I gave him examples, and it was a competency frame, there were examples of it where I could demonstrate I was doing what the competency framework said strategic was, um, that I realized the reason he saw that was because actually he didn't really understand strategic. This, this chap wasn't strategic at all. And so he didn't really recognize it in others. So sometimes you might, you might actually be really strategic, but um, perhaps you're not recognizing it or others aren't recognizing you having that capability. So we've got 75% of voter. Come on, there's still a few more of you can vote. I've got about, um, I'll give you another few seconds. Go on. Uh, you can eat your lunch at the same time and vote. We've got 78% voted. Let's see. Let's see if I can get to 80% and then I'll close the poll and I'll share this with you. All right, here we go. So here we are. So in actual fact, it's looking like there is quite a mix. So we've got 7% um, of people actually do feel pretty, pretty confident. I don't know if it's the same 7%. Only 1% of people feels um, confident about, about defining success metrics. Uh, but we see in the middle, actually, there's really quite a low number of 60% of us feel we could do with some more confidence in that area at the moment. And I can see from the chat here, we've got people who are quite new into HR um, and some perhaps junior roles. So this is a brilliant time uh, to get on and, and develop yourself and think more about what these could be. Oops, sorry, I went a bit too keen there. Let me just go back. So... In terms of this, if we're thinking about if you're starting out your HR career or if you're a line manager, it's absolutely fine because we can be strategic in either of those and having a scorecard is relevant whatever role we're in. Um, if we want to evolve up the value chain, it's really about us thinking less transactionally or developing our skills if we have to do transactional activities, which um, may be part of our role. So a transactional activity, I would say, is something like a recruitment. It might be payroll. It might be um, administering uh, disciplinaries or sort of contracts, things like managing furlough. So anything that's an essentials activity, they can be really time consuming, those sort of transactional day to day activities. And the problem with a transactional activity like that, something day to day is it can swallow all your time up. And when you're really busy doing those kind of activities, you probably don't feel you've got the time or almost the freedom of mind to look up, to think about the more strategic activities and the challenge really is almost saying so I might be recruiting but it's always about us thinking why am I doing this how am I adding value to the organization by doing this what is the purpose of this activity that I'm doing um, and how can I make it as productive as possible so understanding why we're doing things also if at all possible can we take admin heavy transactional processes so for example appraisals if you're doing an appraisal on um, a spreadsheet or a paper type activities there are activities recruitment the same where you can use applicant tracking systems are the ways in which you can turn them into business as usual into a process and maybe automate them because if you can automate things and take that can take you away from having to spend lots of time being administrative which then frees you up to look at the value of what you're doing and how you can do it better. 
So think about um, how can you operate, operationalize things which are perhaps admin heavy or transactional. And then it's about thinking about how am I delivering these in a way that absolutely is driving the business strategy. So if we do have an appraisal and we have got um, something to do with the business strategy, then do people have a connection between the objectives and the business strategy that they're being appraised against? Do they connect? Um, have we got corporate goals or values, um, let's say behaviours that are being connected with the way in which we might manage people if we had a 360 feedback tool for development. Are we linking these things together um, and are we making sure that the people who are the talent of the future are the people who are developed in a way? So it's about making connections between our people's stuff and the overall business strategy and making sure that they're supporting and reinforcing each other. Then for you to get people to recognize that you're being strategic, it's about communicating the links. Because many of us, I think quite a lot of you are probably standalone if you're in people. Again, tell me if you're in a standalone role or part of a larger team. If you're in a standalone role, it can feel, particularly in the people role, depending on the culture of the business that you're in, you might find that you are the only person thinking in a certain way. And you may or may not feel that your people related skills are being valued. Um, it might be that the rest of the you know, people talk about the numbers, the finance director gets the um, drives the meetings that you're involved in because it's all about numbers or sales. It's all about sales. So often these things, um, they're not connected together so well. And the reality is, if you want to be taken seriously with a people activity, you need to help make the connection between whatever you're suggesting and the overall business goals. So in the centre of this image, I've got business growth. And let's say you're saying we, what we really need to do is to align our reward policy, our bonuses with business growth. Um, and it's helping people to know, well, why do you want to do that? Well, because obviously you want to encourage people to uh, deliver the behaviours that actually are driving the business forward, as opposed to, <clears throat> let's say, um, an incremental pay increase approach where there's no direct relationship between reward and growth. Now, incidentally, I'm not saying you need to have performance related pay. I'm just saying if that was something you were looking at, then do you have a connection between the way people are rewarded? And it doesn't even have to be pay. It could be making development opportunities available to people who are demonstrating the behaviors that are driving the business forward. So it's aligning, let's say, your reward strategy. It could be making sure that people have got clear goals that are aligned with the business and linking those together. Um, and it's, it might be you say, right, okay, if we want to encourage our line managers to be better at people management. So some of you will be working in a virtual environment at the moment. And again, actually just put in the chat, um, what's the status of your working environment at the moment? Have you got everybody in an office or in their normal place of work? Have you got everybody remote staying that way? Or have you got a hybrid setup? So just so office, hybrid or remote, let's get a sense of how people are working in your organisations. And I'll have a look at what's coming through. Um, so we've got lots of hybrid and lots of remote. So what you might have is line managers who are saying, well, why are you saying that I've got to bother about people's well-being? Or why do I need to understand people's motivation or spend more time talking to them on one-to-ones in this hybrid world? And you need to make that connection about their engagement. And if we're going to drive the business forward, people need to stay, stay focused. Um, and that's the only way in which we're going to keep connected in order to drive the business forward and deliver business growth. It sounds really, really obvious. I apologize. It feels like I'm saying stucking eggs. It's really strange though, because lots of people just don't join the dots because you might, they, go, they look at the spreadsheet, they look at the numbers and they don't get the connection between the numbers and people. So what I'm trying to say is our job is making that connection between people and numbers. It's spelling it out. It's helping them join the dots. It's saying which means that you know, if we spend um, a bit of quality time at the start of each day or at the start of each week in a team huddle, ensuring that everyone in the team is really clear on what their goals are for the week, we're going to achieve more in this remote hybrid setup. And I know you used to not have to do that because you saw people all the time, but now we don't. So it's about changing our management style. And that's the way in which we're going to deliver results in this new hybrid environment helping people to make that connection. If we don't help people understand that, they are isolated, they're working on their own, their productivity might go down, um, and they're 
less likely to um, have that clarity and be productive. Uh, so it's helping people think about what the connections are. You could do, say the same thing about trusting people. So in these new environments, it's a slightly new communication if you're trying to influ in, um, influence people. So now on to another question, and I think I did another poll on here just to make it easier. Um, right, I think I probably should forgot to share the results of the last one. So that was the previous one. I'm just relaunching my poll. <clears throat> no, I'm not. Ah, here, here we go, Helen, I might need help, let me see. Have I got another one? I thought um, I'd set a, can you see a second poll? One second, so. Did I not say it? Just, uh, you've got a vision one. Yes, that's one. If you can find that one for me and put that up. Yeah. So it's just a quick one, guys, which is a yes, no, maybe. Thank you. See, I thought I was doing so well, wasn't I? But I still need, <laughs> need my expert support. So these two questions, again, we can use the poll for. So do you, does your business have a clearly defined strategy or vision? No, kind of, but not particularly well defined. So a rough idea. Yes, but it's a closely guarded secret. Um, yes, clearly defined and, and cascaded. So that's your first one. And then second one is, do people have clearly defined goals that align with the strategy? And I'll give you, again, we've got 56%, uh, a few more people have chance to vote. And then we'll remember to share you with the results this time. Go on, a couple more and I'll get to 80% and I'll share it. Um, this one, I did share it last time. Oh, you, you did? Oh, thank you. There you go then, brilliant. Do you want to share this one for me then? Helen please are we up to numbers yeah great we've gone over 80 yeah okay I will brilliant so um so what we've got here is actually quite a number of you have got a clearly defined strategy and goal which is great um so that is puts you in quite a good position um to be able to set up your balance scorecard because you know what you need to do to align with when we we'll talk about that shortly um some of you sounds like you might need to do a bit of influencing at the top either for the exec to share it or um, to help them define it because it's quite hard to align with something which is vague. That said, it's not impossible. So you're in a good starting position for us to be able to build our balanced scorecard. And we've got some people, do people have clearly defined goals? It's interesting, isn't it? Some do. Um, and a 20% say yes, so well done there. Um, and some don't. So that that no, those of you who got no, I would really strongly recommend that you um, influence that it's going to be very hard to be productive without having clearly defined goals and in a hybrid environment, really hard. Um, and some do maybe how can we be more, be more consistent um, with things, make sure that people have got the right goals um, and that side of things. That is really typical that, you know, if we, it's a bit of hit and miss. So if you want to build, and I know some of you are in L and D and some of you are in HR, and I know some of you are line management, um, the same thing you can take the same approach to this so let's say you're you're responsible for an area of manufacturing or engineering you can absolutely do that so these are the five simple steps this is pure common sense but i would really encourage you to do if you want to build a strategy this will also help you to be seen as strategic going back to my point earlier so um and amy i'll come back to that question it looks like a question at the end that one i'll think about what you're saying there so um the first one I say if you possibly can can you get some time with the senior team so even if you're in a relatively junior role you know most of them will give you half an hour of your, of your time could you and it might be a zoom now but could you possibly understand the key drivers and challenges ahead so what is it that the business the the CEO or the the board are concerned about worried about or aspiring to and of course We've probably got some no-brainer things going on there are restructures and there is a hybrid we've got an issue about productivity in a hybrid working environment or a remote working environment that's a no-brainer um, that many of us would need to be thinking about how can we drive, divide stra design strategies to support there so once you understand what those key drivers and challenges might be um, so it could be that uh, it's a very competitive marketplace or there's a new competitor that struck up so it might be how are we going to how we're going to be more competitive so if you were in a product marketing area it might be about um, emphasizing your usps if you're in training and development it might be about ensuring that the um, salespeople understand what the USP, sorry, which is unique selling points are, what your differentiators are. Um, so it might be about understanding those sort of things in terms of how we might link it. So you can see how I'm thinking about what are the connections if we've got a competitive marketplace, how might that link to, to 
um, as in training with L&D, so you might need to train people. It could also be that this competitor is going to poach your staff. So you might have to do more about talent management or recruitment. So there's other things where that's going to link into the areas of your job that sit within your responsibility. So it's seeing what the categories, the drivers are, and then thinking, what is it that's within the realm of my job, the sphere of my job, and how can I influence that? It's about sphere of influence. But generally, we can't drive, we can't um, directly influence things, but it, um, directly affect things, but we can influence them. And it's thinking about what it is that we do within our job role, which will connect. And once you're making those connections, you might then say, OK, so would it make a difference, for example, um, if we upskilled all the salespeople so that they can sell against this new competitor? And you gain that agreement from that senior board that, yes, that would make sense as a logical connection. Now, you can see the benefit of that, can't you? So in this particular example, um, we've got a competitor. I've adjusted, we've agreed we need to upskill the, the um, salespeople. When I then go to them and say, please give me some money to pay for training or learning man the new LMS or something, um, then I'm going to be much more likely to get budget. Because one of the things that we often find is people don't know how to build business cases. This is a business case because we're connecting with the strategy and we're making it overt. And then we could discuss that further. So we might be, think about other enablers or solutions. So it does it need to be a multifaceted way of bringing a strategy together? So it might be partly talent retention. It might be partly training. Um, it might be um, other forms of, of development or recruitment. And it might be a combined, there may be other enablers or solutions that we can bring in to support this strategy. Then what I've always found is if you can create some sort of visual or strategy map. So what I just talked about there was perhaps one example there, but there's usually a number of influences that might drive that strategy of being more competitive, for example. If you can tie those together in some sort of PowerPoint image, and I'll give you an example of one in a moment, you find that it helps people to get buy in. Now, often you do find that people go, I need to write a strategy. Um, and I realize that quite often you might need to write a strategy or a business case in more detail. That's absolutely fair enough. Um, but having a visual, you know, they say a, a, a picture says a thousand words. It really does sum things up and it helps reconnect people with the strategy. And it's something that even if you are in something like the NHS where you have to write a 56 page document to get it, get it signed off if you can summarize that in a visual it will help people to understand why you're doing things which again will support you later when you're trying to get budget or support something so try to create a visual to support your written strategy if you need to write one and then the final point is then once you start to implement it it's about gathering feedback and measuring progress and that's where your scorecard comes in do feel free to put any questions if anyone's got any f um, further questions on there or anything they want me to address at the end. But what I'm going to do here is I'm going to give you an example of a, a people related strategy on a page. So this particular scenario was we had a business issue um, and this particular organization was really suffering against the competition because they had the wrong skills in their organization and they were also losing people. People were leaving to go and join this competitor. So we didn't have enough of the right skills in the organization. Now, within that organization, we'd already done some, um, there were clear expectations about how people should be line managed. There was ongoing performance management. These were things which are set in, set in place already, which were the foundation of being able to develop people further and uh, dealing with this issue. So then we need to think about how are we going to retain the people and actually, I'm going to put all that because I think it's easier if I go from the whole picture and then I can explain it to you there. So what we're trying to say here is, so this was the issue. We've got the suffering here. And what we really needed to do is have a dual strategy. We needed to increase the skill and capability of the people within the organization. Um, and we also needed to increase employee engagement and retention so they were less likely to leave. So both of those have slightly different drivers. So if I'm thinking that part of the solution about helping to retain talent and, and help us to compete better, increasing skill, as I gave my earlier example, some of that's about training and development of people. The other piece is about making sure that they don't want to leave in the first place. They don't see that it's a better place to go if they went elsewhere. So this is why having this platform of um, managers who were managing their stuff well, because the evidence is that people who manage people well 
they're more engaged and they're less likely to leave. So this is where you have to explain to people where your line manager says, well, oh, what's the point in one-to-ones regularly? Or why do I have to do appraisals or objectives? Well, actually, it's about retention. It's about developing people and it's about motivating people and making them feel valued. Now, if you hadn't got that in place, then what we needed to do was the first point here on the left in orange is we needed to upskill the people managers. So we might have needed to educate them and we might have needed to train them. They might also have needed coaching and mentoring to upskill them to be better in terms of developing people to learn and support individuals in learning. We built in enabling technologies. So whether it was learning management courses for managers to develop themselves with, whether it was product courses um, through technology or forums or collaboration where people could share product knowledge, looking at enabling technologies or performance management software, again, where you can enable that kind of thing. So you might look at these things. All of these are pillars that were supporting things. We have a variety of learning resources so people could develop themselves in different ways that suited their learning styles. Um, there was social learning sharing. So all of this was about developing this empowered learning culture and managing people and engaging people um, to do that. And this defining career skills and paths is about retention. Now you could have more pillars, less pillars. Um, none of those we're saying is one pillar on its own is going to deliver it. But in this example here, um, it's, it's about helping to put a number of strategies in place, which if they are all put into practice effectively, is going to drive that learning culture and it's going to have those, um, the, the impact that you're after. And of course, that key there is if you have that impact that you're after, um, or when people can see this, a lot of the time we're looking for budget. It's much easier to get budget when when they can see the strategy on the page and they say, ah, oh, why are you saying we need to invest in this technology? Well, this is why, all right? Because this is about driving our learning culture and it's about retaining people and increasing our skill and capabilities so that we can compete with competitor X. So it allows us to join everything together. And again, what we're saying, you sound much more strategic because you're linking it together. Right, so I'm just gonna look at, uh, I've got a couple of questions in. Um, our strategy includes a restructure, so it's not super clear on purpose how to work with that. Um, so, so are you saying that there isn't a purpose about restructure, there isn't a clear message? Because uh, often with a restructure, you do want to have a story, whether it's about business survival or about competition. Um, it, it's, it might be a high level vision, Amy. So I, I might need a little bit more information on that and I'll come back in a bit more detail. Um, Okay, right. So, um, so we're trying to, yeah, so that's difficult, isn't it? So often that's about change management. Um, what I would say there is, is that's almost a distraction that's going to go on in the background where, what I would say, for, so Amy's, if you've got a situation where you know that you've got to hold the information back because you don't want people, one of the reasons you don't want to share that people are going to lose jobs is that you might lose the best people. Often the best people jump first um, in terms of, of addressing things and it becomes a panic it would be quite useful to make sure that there's very strong messaging around um, we need to be I don't know, a highly competitive modernized organization therefore we've aligned our structure in a certain way to um, allow us to uh, support our customer so let's say we've realigned to support our customer sectors or whatever it is there might be something about why a structure is happening the other thing which you could do if you're in an HR or L&D role is ensure that there is development and support for those people who are staying and talk about talent management and retention, uh, maybe retention is a bit of a poor example here, but talk about what development there is and how we value people and we want to get the best out of people. So whether you communicate that after the restructure is being announced, what's important is the majority of people will still be staying. So they need to feel that they are valued and also that any, um, any restructure is being managed humanely and being managed um, well because people get concerned but the problem with the restructure is people get distracted so I would be quite clear in making sure this is what we need to do we need to achieve these are our business goals it's actually the restructure is just something that's happening along the way you must still have corporate strategic goals that need to be um, hit and um, and achieved so making sure that those haven't been lost sight of um, and Liam saying how do you support a manager who might not know what the actual problem is within their remit um, in order for you to go complete step one to three, which is of the previous slide. I think I would coach them um, and, and get people to talk about, okay, what's in your role and what is your responsibility and how do you think that might influence? I would just want to say, what is the, how can you influence 
how can any of us if we all think about what's your most businesses need to grow or most businesses need to survive through this so they need to do whatever your business is whether it's serve a customer um, or whether it's about selling things uh, so what is it that that particular area of responsibility does that can drive that growth what can they improve how can we do what we're doing better faster in a slicker way so it's helping people to think about those kind of things do feel free if I'm not answering your question properly um, and uh, I'm really happy to pick them up because I'm only gathering a little bit of the gist from the chat so the main thing we talked about the balanced scorecard this is how you can make these things measurable so you've got your overall strategy or goals a number of you have got business goals this is about talking about how we can align with it so the balanced scorecard it came from um, it was written back by Kaplan and Norton in the 90s and what's very interesting about it is that it is definitely more than jargon it's a pretty good one very many businesses um, still are actually are just driven by numbers and so you get the, 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 they say, oh, have we hit this number? What is our turnover? And that is what's driving. That's all they talk about. The start of the board meeting is what the numbers are. Now, that's well and good, but that numbers are effectively measuring what you've already done. They are a result. So they are a lagging indicator, as in they're telling you what's happened in the past. So Kaplan and Norton said that if you build a balanced scorecard, what you also need to do is have metrics around your leading indicators. And leading indicators are things like customer satisfaction. So you can imagine if your customers aren't satisfied, then you're going to have some attrition. Um, your processes are about how effective and efficient you are. So if you can shave some time off your manufacturing process, you're going to be able to produce more and therefore in theory be more profitable. Um, things like learning and growth, that's for me, is where HR and L&D would sit. So it's a setting targets around people. Very often, if you have a staff survey or an engagement survey, that um, links to whether people are going to stay with the business or not. So that would be a, more of a leading indicator of um, value with people. So this is the principle of it. And I was just going to say, if let's just have a little play because you've been listening to me talk for a minute. Um, annotations. Can you find the annotation screen? I know somebody found it earlier, I think, with a drawing piece. If you were to um, grab a stamp, so what you're going to say where it is, is, Helen. Yeah, if at the top of the screen it should be view options, it should say you are viewing this in the Carney screen, and next to that will be view options. And if you click on that, it should say annotate. And when you click on annotate, the little drop, the little bar should appear drops down so in that when you find that there's a stamp so choose your favorite stamp and what I'd like you to do is first of all stamp where you see that there are metrics in your business so are they are the ones that are in finance or do you have things about production times or customer satisfaction net promoter store do you have um, learning and growth type ones so stamp where you're seeing them and you can put more than one let's just get a sense of where you're seeing these metrics Lots of drawing on the page. So it's a good mix of things that are coming through here. And actually, it's looking quite balanced. So it sounds like some of you have got balanced scorecards activities going on. And fewer ones about process at the moment, but maybe you're not quite thinking of those at the moment. So what would be great is, well, I'm going to go on to the next slide and I'll explain a little bit more about it, is to hear a few examples of how you can, um, of, of the sort of, let's talk about your learning and growth ones if you've got something which is a metric that you think is in your learning and growth area and uh helen i'll let you find oh, can you click hang on can i do it close i can do it actually i found it um so if you want to put in the chat do you have what would be an example of a learning and growth or an hr or l d metric that you've got so far and while I explain these so financial metrics would tend to be you know how if, if we're thinking about this from an L&D point of view rather than just talking about company turnover we're talking about how could we quantify the financial impact of L&D or HR over the next year so that would be a financial and I'll give you examples of these if it was customer it's about thinking who are our customers is it internal customers or external customers how can we measure the breadth and effectiveness of what we provide to our internal and external customers and how satisfied are they process that's a bit where I was talking about transactional things so what are our internal systems and repeatable processes and how can we measure their effectiveness and then finally our learning and growth ones how are we future-proofing and aligning our HR learning and development interventions with future 
business and skill requirements so this whole strategic things other cultural things so those are general questions if you're trying to think about this and of course I've done this from an L&D point of view but um, the person earlier said how do you support a manager Liam who doesn't know these might be questions that you could ask again as coaching questions so you know how might you quantify the financial impact of your department over the next year how do we how do we show it making a difference so often people like accounts they might go well we can't do anything well actually maybe you can maybe you can reduce debt a days because that brings cash into the business earlier it's helping people think a bit harder about how you can measure what we're doing ideally as leading indicators that are going to support so here let's go into the next slide where i've got some examples hang on a minute i think i've got my that's because i'm on my annotate thing so a mouse right So here's an example of maybe an HR balance scorecard. Did I skip over the L&D one? I did. I'll start with the HR one. So these might be things like average recruitment or agency spend per hire. So what we're seeing here is not, and the point of the balance scorecard is not just about catching it once, it's about using it as a benchmark that you can then um, progress against. So let's say we spend, it costs us £2,000 per head per new head. If we could reduce that to £1,500, then that's money in the business, isn't it? Um, and also, if we can retain staff, that's less money spent on agency. So what kind of things can we do to reduce our agency spend? So we might say, well, I can negotiate with the agents or we could recruit internally or we could go online. So there's things that you can do there. We might look at how, we, how much money we spend on benefits relative to the satisfaction with the benefits. Is the money we're spending on people valued by them? You could also look at things about you know, pay differentials between high and low performers. And obviously you have things like gender pay, pay gap information. If we're looking at customer, so how are we helping our internal customers? We might think about things like what number of jobs are filled internally. So that might be talent development. And I saw that um, Heather said they've got early career pathways, engagement, absolutely. These are examples of things that would sit in this area that you can track. Um, thinking about have they got clarity about objectives, organizational purpose or value. So how aligned do people against what they need to do? You could think about metrics like how many um, employees per HR professional. This is quite an old fashioned one. Um, and in theory, the, you can increase the number and therefore HR is costing you less or providing more value. Of course, you can only really do that maybe if you're bringing systems in or otherwise you might actually not be as effective in providing a service. So you've always got to be careful that the things that we measure make sure they have a positive impact rather than a negative impact. Process things like speed of hire, so how quickly can we fill those gaps, um, appraisal rates, one-to-one -one rates, objectives, again things like that. Appraisal rate is a classic one because actually lots of businesses measure appraisal rate but there's nothing there about the quality and actually there's evidence that says that a bad appraisal is more, worse than, than um, no appraisal. So you might be measuring a process but you want to probably have a qualitative measure in there as well to make sure that it's done well so it might be about quality objectives or it might be frequency of conversations so you've got process type um, tracking items um, and then organizational capacity so it might be recognition are people developing each other your succession planning usage of tools all those sort of things, success, um, employee suggestion schemes, all of those would be valid tools. Now, I'm not saying you don't want 12, but the thing to do is pick, the, let's say, a couple in each quadrant that are most likely to drive the activities or the business that you want to drive. That's the key. So again, being strategic. There's no point in measuring use of collaboration technologies if actually everything is done independently in your organisation and it's, uh, you know, the, the it's a research organization and there's there's no value to it so it needs to be something that is strategically aligned same thing approach if you're looking at l d so we'll just pick a few examples here as i said i'll provide you with these slides so if you want to refer back to them you absolutely can uh it's looking at things like it might look about how we're spending money let's say we've got um a, a learning management system and we might say that actually we've got a learning management system and only five percent of people are using five percent of the courses so we might want to therefore increase uptake of the courses or change the courses or remove it altogether so you've got all of these sort of options that you can put in place i'll let you read through some of these things so process you know are we managing compliance quite often we have to track things like that so are our processes uh, effective without any gaps in them how quickly are we meeting training needs 
and then might look at skills. So how quickly are we um, upskilling people? We might have 360 feedback in the organisation where uh, we're tracking key competencies and skills. So those are ideas that you can put in place. Um, and thank you also, if you want to check the chat, uh, there's also information on how to build a balanced call. Caitlin, is, is that the, uh, that's, could you also post, Caitlin, the um, link to the HR Uprising podcast on it as well? Uh, so people can grab that if it's helpful to them. So in summary, uh, if you're doing your balance scorecard, don't choose too many. Try and choose metrics that are leading indicators or more likely to influence the future. That might not mean they're the easiest ones. It takes a while to get your balance scorecard accurate. Uh, it can be tra tricky, um, but try to think of ones that are leading indicators, i.e. the ones that are actually going to drive the behaviours that you want. Uh, do play around with your metrics, refine your metrics, and of course, make sure the metrics you choose do align with the business strategy because the whole point of this is it's connecting up. Your HR strategy should be supporting the business strategy and your HR metrics should be supporting your HR strategy. So they're all connected together. So that's the end of the content there. This was just to mention, um, we'll provide you with a link to the ebook, which may be of use to you in this hybrid, many of you in a hybrid workplace. So I've written an ebook, which is based on our perform model, which runs through management, virtual management uh, 101, basically. So if you want that, you can download that. And as I said, we'll be, uh, keep an eye on the HR uprising. Maybe if you've got line managers that report into you, you might want to direct them towards those episodes that will go out from next Wednesday. If you uh, enjoy the webinars and you want to join more of them, I do two webinars every month now. I tend to do one which is suitable for everybody, so line managers, um, and one which is maybe more learning and development or HR specific. So on the 7th of October, we've got one which is all about practical well-being. Um, and given we're going to be heading into dark and dingy winter, certainly over here in the UK, maybe not so much for some of you guys in sunnier climes, um, that might be a relevant one to let people know about. Um, the links are available in here and we'll also send links out on the email uh, and you can see the other modules that I will be running. If anyone has got any questions or would like any support, please feel free to put them in the chat. I'll just put this up if you want to link in with me, it'd be great if you want to link in with me, follow on social media, um, the stuff on change as well, that's about changesuperhero.com, that's on the book that I've written, there's a load of tools. So lots of useful links, feel free to copy those down. Um, thank you so much for joining us, I hope you found this of use, your feedback is really valuable um, to us, do please tell us what works, what other topics you'd like us to do webinars or podcasts on, I'd be very grateful. And if you do have any other specific questions that you want um, me to respond to, I'm happy to uh, respond to those in the chat or even um, discuss if needed another five minutes. So thanks guys, if you want to go, feel free. I'll keep an eye on the chat and address any questions. Yes, um, we'll, send this card, we'll be sending the slides out to you automatically, Alessio, yes, don't worry. Look out for an email from Caitlin. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. Thanks, Heather. Nice to have you on again. It's nice to see familiar names, I have to say. Caitlin's just putting Felix. Oh, I didn't mention this if anyone's still listening. So there's a LinkedIn community that we run. You might want to join that if you want to collaborate with other like minded HR L&D people. That's the link to go directly there if you want to join it. Um, do feel free. Those of you who are from um, overseas, I know I speak quite quickly. Were you able to follow me or should I have been slowing down a little bit? It's all well and good now. I'm slowing down asking you this question, aren't I? Was it, <laughs> was it okay to follow? Thank you, Biliana. Okay, well, it looks to me like, um, it, brilliant, Stella, thank you. Good to hear. You could follow. <laughs> It was quite fast. I do have lots of words to get out, but that's great. And I say, if you want to listen to the podcast, I go through similar content and actually that's not too bad. I reckon I've got about 30% of people from um, overseas, Angola, Nigeria. Um, we had Philippines earlier. It's amazing. 
thank you for joining. I'm going to close this down now because I'm not seeing any extra questions come through. Do feel free to get in, in touch um, and we will send the slides out to you. Absolutely. Many thanks.